Gauss's law is very, very cool. It's very abstract. It's very weird, uh, very important. Um, and the idea that Gauss came up with is can, can apply to things other than just electric fields. It can apply to magnetic fields and gravitational fields. Anything that kind of has uh, this idea of arrows, of lines, of stuff moving through space, flux. Um, and, you know, this gets into a, a general field of mathematics, you know, that many of you are going to study later on, um, uh, vector calculus um, and uh, scalar fields and vector fields and all that. And it is very cool stuff. So if you study it now, when you get to that late, the other stuff later, you'll, you'll see, oh, yeah, I remember doing this in physics. Um, so let's review uh, uh, what electric flux is. And then what is electric flux through a closed surface? Use that using this definition of it. And then we'll get to uh, Gauss's law. So now, uh, well, actually, let's combine this. If I have some closed surface, some amoeba, and um, I've got flux, electric flux, some weird shape like this, and it just extends out. Now notice that my, you know, these are electric field lines, and they represent what my test charge would feel if uh, I put it, placed it somewhere in this field. If I put a positive test charge right here, this by looking at this field, I'd say, oh, okay, I'm going to be moving in, off in that direction somewhere. I'll feel a uh, force in that direction, you know. So. Um, you know, that's what's going on right there. So it kind of gives me an idea. But but what was the cause of this these this flux? Well, somewhere out in the universe, out here somewhere, there was some isolated positive charge. And somewhere way out here in the universe is, it is negative charge that it's trying to get to, these lines. Remember, these, these electric field lines start at positive and end at negative, start and also, the number of lines you draw is really proportional to the amount of, of charge that's been separated and how crowded those, those separated charges are. All right? if, I, if I have one, two, three, four, five, six units of charge isolated over here, and here's the, the negative charge where that's at, um, that's going to affect how crowded these field lines are. If I make these more crowded, if I squeeze these in like this, let me get on camera, make sure I'm on camera, okay. If I squeeze these six charges, you know, like this, um, and then uh, maybe the negative charges are, are, are still out here somewhere. Well, that's going to affect what the field looks like, right? It's, it's, the field lines are going to be something like, like this, I don't know. Um, you know they're going to be. Um, this is terrible, but but the point is is that how crowded those field lines are, how dense they are, is affect, affected by how crowded the isolated charges are. Okay, and remember that the field lines there are no lines of of in reality. It's just a representation of what a test charge will feel at that location in space. And if you're right here you're going to feel a much stronger field. You're going to feel much greater force than, it, than you were if you were up here with the same amount of isolated charge because these charges are farther apart. And so they're not going to apply as great a force to my test charge because they're farther away. Right? Um, so this all, um, it's, this all pretty, pretty interesting stuff. And, um, and so we, we said that the amount of flux phi uh, you know the total amount of flux here if I surrounded this with an area you know and I made it perpendicular and all that that we said well let's just say that the, um, the, the amount of flux which I can represent by you know number of field lines but is equal to you know E dot A here the electric field dotted with A and of course, you know, if the electric field lines are are not uniform, and if the area is got a curve to it or something like that, 
you have to break it up into a zillion little areas and add them together. So you have to use integral calculus. Hello. Uh, yeah, Caitlin, this is for you. So, um, so we uh, so we've got this, and and you know, so if I've got some curved, well, let, let, hey, here's an open area. Well, here's my little tiny da, and here's its direction. Here's my little da. Here's its direction. Here's another little da, and you know, so you just you have to calculate how much flux is going through there and through there, through there, through there, through there, and then you sum them all together, and that's what the integral sign means. Sum them all together. Now usually we will make this a closed surface, seal it up, and so if I make this a closed surface, I put a little circle on my integral sign and say, hey, my, my surface area that I'm integrating over it's totally closed. And by the way, even if you don't understand at this point in your mathematical training, the, the, the mathematical techniques, um, you can understand this conceptually. By the way, my mathematical training on how to do you know all this calculus is pretty limited. But I understand the concept. You know, hey, I'm, I'm just going to multiply E times all these little tiny areas, add them all up, and my surface area? It's closed. It, 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 it completely encloses some volume of space. This is all in cross section, like right here. Okay. Well, now uh, we said that if my I've got charge out here, I've got charge out here in the universe somewhere, and and what I'm doing is uh, for every field line that goes in, there's a field line that comes out, in and out, in and out. So if the if the electric flux is going into my volume, I, I call that negative flux. Um, and then if it's going out, I call it positive, you know, and that works based on this definition. Uh, then, well, there's just as much flux going in as coming out, and so it's going to be equal to zero. Okay, and that's kind of what we talked about last time. Well, what if, though, I put some isolated charge inside my volume. So let's take a look. Here's my amoeba. And now I'm going to put, I could put a point charge in there. Well, now I'm going to have lines of flux coming out like this, right? And now we are going to have some net flux and uh, coming out of this uh, volume. And, and, and why? Because there's, there's no lines of flux going in. It, it's only coming out. So here's my little tiny DA. And it's got a direction like this. So there's my DA vector. And here's my electric field vector like this. So I just multiply the you know this times this you know using the dot product and all that, and I get a value for the flux, and then I just do that you know a infinite number of times and add it all together, and I've got the total amount of flux. Well, here's the deal. Here's one thing I want you to see: the total amount of flux coming out of here. Do you see that it doesn't? Here's what I want you to understand right now. Really think about this. And this is kind of abstract and weird, but, but it's actually kind of obvious and logical. It doesn't matter what shape I surround this with, right? What if I put a volume that looked like this? Oh, that was, that's really bad. Sorry. It looks pretty bad. Uh, I'll, I'll make it a little darker. Oh, what did I do? Okay. Okay. So do you see that there's just as much flux coming out of this shape as there was this other shape? There's just as many lines coming out of it as there was. Uh, in other words, the amount of flux coming out of my closed surface 
is independent of the shape of my closed surface. Doesn't matter, it's the same amount of flux. And how much flux, how many of these field lines, really only strictly depends on how much charge I put inside there, right? If I double the amount of charge in there, what should I do with my field lines? I would double the number of field lines, that would double the amount of flux. Because flux is a way of thinking about how, much, how many field lines there are. Um, so this is what we're going to do. This is going to lead us now to Gauss's law. And what I'm going to do is, is choose a very specific situation. And we're going to get a very interesting result in my opinion. All right, so let's have a point charge. Okay, we'll just put a certain amount of point charge there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a certain distance away. And I'm going to call that R. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to surround this now with a a sphere. I'm going to surround this point charge with a sphere. Now a sphere is a closed surface, isn't it? Now why would I enclose a point charge with a sphere? Because I actually want to calculate how much flux is coming out of there. Let's give this a charge Q there in the center. Well, the total amount of flux coming out of there is equal to E dot dA. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can see it better. Okay, folks, I don't know, I don't want to have to do integration, okay? because it's hard. Integration is hard. When it comes to this part of what we're going to call Gauss's law, oh, and this surface is closed, so I should put a circle in there. Integration is not our friend. So what I did, though, is I chose a sphere because what is the electric field right there? What's the strength of the electric field at that point? Well, we know what the electric field is for a point charge. E is equal to K Q over R squared, isn't it? In what direction? The R hat direction. Well, look at my little DA right here. There's DA. And it has an area of uh, dA. <laughs> yeah, OK. But what direction is it in right there? It's in the, it's in the, it's the same direction. OK, so that's pretty cool. Um, I can get, when I go r hat dot r hat, I get 1. So I get rid of the dot product. But what about over here? What's what's E over here? E is equal to KQ over R squared. Do you see that it's the same? The electric field is the same as it was over here in terms of magnitude. And you still have the R hat dot R hat. You know, the DA is the same. So what happens to the electric field in my integral? It doesn't change as I, as I move around the surface, as I change my little DAs, the electric field is a constant. Yes, what does that let me do? I can pull it out of the integral. And let's just say that it's also, the direction of the areas is always in the same direction as the electric field. So I get E times the sum of all the little da's. Well, this is a sphere. When I sum all of the little da's, what am I going to get? I'm going to get the surface area of a sphere. And we all remember what the surface area of a sphere is, don't we? Yeah, it's 4 pi r squared. 
everybody knows that, right? Okay, so here's what we got. V is going to be equal to the electric field, which is KQ over R squared. Right, there's my electric field, times the area, which is 4 pi R squared. Now tell me why this is awesome. What happens to the R? It cancels. It doesn't matter what the radius is. I can surround it with the little baby sphere. Or I can surround it with a big daddy sphere. Or here's, you know, just right, the mama sphere. Okay, so it doesn't matter uh, what the site, what the radius of the sphere is, because the radius cancels out. And I get this. I get um, 4 pi k, 4 pi times the electric constant, times q. Well, this is wonderful, okay? And here's why it's wonderful. It now gives us a way of figuring out how much electric flux there is in terms of how much charge has been separated. This is the charge that's enclosed by my volume, my closed surface. So I'm going to call it Q enclosed. And it's just equal to these, const these constants of nature. 4 is a constant. 4 doesn't change. It's always 4. Pi doesn't change, at least in our flat universe. K, as far as we know, is a constant in nature. It's just how strong the electric force is. And then times the charge. So this is our variable. So the amount of electric flux is directly proportional to how much charge is inside there. If I double the amount of charge, I'll double the amount of flux times all these constants. Now, you can leave it as 4 pi k. That's totally cool. But remember, we had another way of expressing the electric constant. We said that um, we have this idea of epsilon naught this permittivity of free space that we talked about as being 1 over 4 pi k. So what, so what we actually have here now is uh, this idea right here. The amount of electric flux is equal to the closed integral of E dot dA and this is going to be equal, when I substitute this in here, I get the charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught. Did I do what on purpose? Is that for any shape or just Yeah, this is general. Now, now um, this is Gauss's law right here. Usually, we don't really care about the uh, amount of electric flux. Uh, usually, we're just going to be doing using this, you know, these two guys here, which we'll do next time. But this is Gauss's law. Oops, left off an S. Okay, Gauss's law, and it's one of the most important laws of nature in electromagnetism. But here's what it's saying. If I take a charge and I enclose it with some closed surface, and it doesn't have to be a sphere. I used a sphere because the math is easy. But if I close it, enclose it with an amoeba, it's going to say, hey, how much flux is coming out of this enclosed surface? Well, how much charge is enclosed by that surface? Divide that by epsilon naught, and that's, our, that's how much flux we have. That's how much electric flux we have. It's a measure of the amount of electric flux. Now, this shape that I enclose my charge with, that's called a Gaussian surface. So this right here is my... 
Gaussian surface. Why, why is that such a big deal? The nerds are getting excited. Yes, the nerds are excited. Yes, so am I. All right, so um, go forth and use Gauss's law for good. <laughs>